of the show where John Romano, Lee Priest, and I vent our frustrations with the world. Today's topic, guys, is going to be, because it's Arnold week, your favorite Arnold classic weekend story. In other words, it could have happened to you, it could have been involved with a bunch of people. The favorite, your favorite thing that has ever happened to you or the most memorable experience you've had at the Arnold, Lee Priest is in the airport getting ready to travel to the United States. Uh, Lee, uh, when was the last time you were in the U.S., actually? Hold on, I think Lee's muted over there. 2010. <laughs> it's been that long, huh? So, wow. wow, a long time yeah, ago. Yeah. And it's when I was with Infinite Labs, and I was at the Arnold Classic. It was the last time I was there, I think. Or the Olympia. Or the Arnold. One of those. They're all the same. Bunch of oily men on stage and posting trunks. They all, they all look alike. <laughs> like are, you, are you actually allowed in the United States? Have you found that out? Yes, of course I am. Um, we'll find out in a couple of hours. Yeah. Yes, I am. <laughs> I, you know, every, every time I go to Australia, Lee, they always pull me aside and, and they always make me go, you know, be interrogated for like six hours before they let me in. Well, well look at you. <laughs> <laughs> If you, haven't, if you haven't got criminal written across your forehead, <laughs> yeah. you know what? You know what? The, yeah, you know what the problem was. I should never admitted that I had a, a felony because Tony Darty told me a long time ago, "Don't say anything about you having a felony." And I, I forgot oh, yeah. once, and I just wrote it down because I figured, hey, it's 2005. It's 15 years ago almost. And ever since that, they interrogate me every time I come in there now. Crazy. Oh, yeah, they don't forget, if you've got felonies now, you can't get into Australia half the time. Everyone living here is a criminal. We started off as a criminal colony, but now if you're a criminal, they won't let you in. Yeah, isn't that irony? Right That's a real big irony, yeah. yeah. All right, so Lee, you've been at the Arnold many times. You've competed at the Arnold many times. What, what would you say would be your most memorable experience that you can think of that sticks out in your head? Uh, it was the time I did an interview for um, Max Muscle magazine. Confessions of a Priest had me on the front dressed in a priest outfit with my arms stretched out. Good David Paul picture. And I talked about the politics in the sport. That's a bit of a shock, isn't it? And I was talking about the judging and stuff. So after Friday, I was at the expo, and this woman come up to me, and she goes, Lee, I was just watching the women's bodybuilding. I was sitting behind the judges, and they had a magazine of you, and they were saying how they're going to screw you tomorrow. I said, really? I said, what was it? And she goes, I sit behind them and they had this magazine passing it around. And she had the magazine she showed me. I said, really? I said, well, fuck it then. I'm not going to compete tomorrow. So come Saturday, I was at the expo. And probably must be always time for prejudging someone coming trying in the expo. Wayne Demilia says, Wayne Demilia says, you're going to get back stage. You're going to get back stage. I said, I ain't fucking competing. I, the woman told me from the Columbus Dispatch. Well, actually, too, when she came on the Friday, she took a photo of me. You probably still find it somewhere. She took a photo and did a big story. So Saturday in the paper had a picture of me doing a double bicep shot saying, Lee pulls out due to politics or something like that. <laughs> so <laughs> so then on Saturday, Wayne's like, Lee, you got to come do it. Someone comes. I said, you tell Wayne I'm not coming. So they disappear. I'm just there signing because they come. I said, Wayne said, you better get back in now. You're going to get fined. I said, look, tell Wayne that's fine. I said, but the woman from the Columbus Dispatch, she'll give a sworn affidavit what she heard the judges saying about me going to get screwed. So he disappeared again. He came back and goes, Wayne said, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. And forget the fine. So that was it. <laughs> <laughs> How did you place that year? But, um, I didn't place it there because I didn't compete. Oh, so you, you didn't compete? Like, oh, you never did it? No. Nah. But how's this? Uh, normally when I competed at the Arnold, I always, I think the highest I got was four. That 2006, people said I should have won it, but I got four. But every other year, I'd always get like seventh place, which was $1,000. That year, I said, screw it. And didn't do it. I was at the expo for the three days. I sold out all my photos, T-shirts, and videos. I made fourteen thousand cash at the booth. So who's the dumb one? I compete for thousand. I made fourteen thousand cash standing at the booth for three days. <laughs> those were the days, John. You remember those days where you could actually make money selling pictures? Yeah. Uh, and everybody wants them for free. I had this one lady come up to me once. She goes, "My son's a big fan of yours." Blah blah blah. You know, you got the signs here. It says photos, ten dollars. Blah blah blah. I signed it. And I handed it to her, and she went to walk away, and Kathy was with the time. Kathy goes, that's $10. And she goes, what? For this? And she threw it back at me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, when I finally, I couldn't wait to start selling pictures to make money. You know, I, I finally got to be very popular, and Metrics signed me. And Metrics had, the, Connolly had this thing with Metrics where he was like, I hate selling pictures. So they would print pictures for you, and you had to sign them for free, which meant you signed 400,000 pictures at every show, and mm -hmm. you made no money for it. But you know you really couldn't complain because you know you were getting paid a nice salary. 
So I never really made a lot of money selling pictures because I was working for metrics for like four or five years. And, and, I, and once you start giving all your pictures away for free, no one's ever going to buy them from you again. So, John, what was your most like memorable experience? I, I, I have two. One, one involves Arnold and one involves you. Which one do you want? Uh, give us both. Give us Arnold first. Well, the Arnold first, I'm going to give you a little backstory so you understand. Um, in 1982 or 83, I was getting ready for a show, and you know, I, I knew Louie. We were friends. We were at World Gym, and I asked him to take a look at me. Lou Ferrigno. So, what? Lou Ferrigno. Ferrigno, right, yeah. So, so I, so I peel off, you know, and Louis, fucking, you know, fucking as, Louis Smith from Seventy Sixth Street, Santa Monica, you dickhead. What's that? <laughs> Say that again, Louis. I said no, Louis, look, I said, no, Louis Smith from Seventy Sixth Street, Santa Monica, you <laughs> dickhead. Of course, Louis Ferrigno, you fucking <laughs> right. That, Louis, no, ne no, no last name necessary. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Sure. Well, is that Louis? Is that Louis? I had a or something, and Louis like looking at me, and then Arnold walks over. Arnold walks over, puts his elbow on Louis' shoulder, and he's like looking over his shoulder. Arnold, John. Arnold, John. Is that Arnold Schwarzenegger? I just want to clarify. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Please, Arnold Schwarzenegger puts his elbow on his shoulder. Lou Ferrigno. Okay. 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 And. And, Thank you, John Romano. <laughs> right, John Romano. <laughs> and, and Arnold, you know, uninvited, says, says gives me this, this critique that he goes, your, your chest is too small, your stomach is too fat, and your arms are too small. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, this is like two days before the show, but Arnold Schwarzenegger, like, takes all the wind out of my sails. And so I... I, and, you know, back then, you know, everybody was practical joking on each other. Lee knows, uh, you know, that, Lou, Arnold had his group of little friends and they were all, you know, homophobic, you know, busting jokes on each other. And everything. there was Alice and there was you remember them all. And so um, so I turned to I turned to Arnold, who I never talked to before in my life, although I tripped over him in the gym every day. And I go, man, you queens get picky in your old age. <laughs> And fucking all of his cronies fucking busted up laughing, and I, like I, I was like one of the few that like ever I got Arnold. So that's great. So many, many, many years later, um, Flex Wheeler gets, you know, has his health issue falling out, and he's coming back, and he's going to do karate exhibit. He's going to fight this uh, karate match. The Arnold, the Expo. You remember that? He was all yeah. tattooed. Yeah, you know? this was after his kidney transplant, right? Right, right after his kidney transplant, and I was taking still photographs of the of the um, of the fight, you know, for the for MD. So Arnold comes on the on the on the mat, you know, on the in the ring, and is you know introducing or uh, uh, talking to um, uh, Flex or something, and, and he looks at me, and he see, and I got the camera, you know, and I put the camera, on, and I look at him, and he looks at me, and we like, had this like three second stare down where I know he remembered it was me, right. That, Called him an old queen. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. It's a good story. We used to, we okay. used to remember, remember at World Gym, John, where I used to have Arnold's um, car park downstairs that looked like a tomb, where Joe Gold made that nice big marble, it's like a big marble slab. And oh, his yeah. Name in gold, had his name in gold Parkinson. on it. And, yeah, so sometimes in the mornings we'd get there before him and put flowers on it. He'd come upstairs and go, you fucking bastards and blah, blah. Because he'd make it look like it's like he's dead. <laughs> you'd always have you always have people too that got there too early would park there and Arnold would park his Hummer right behind them and if they had to go to work Arnold wouldn't move he's like you shouldn't have parked in my spot so he'd leave the Hummer right behind them the whole time right over fucking <laughs> and there's there was one time I used to get ready for the Iron Man Eddie and Julie Arnold and Arnold was standing there watching me do leg extensions I was doing heaps of leg extensions and Arnold's like do you really have to do that and all this sort of stuff I just stopped and I looked at him and I said you know, you're actually right, because here I am, busting my ass, I'm, you know, killing myself, and face it, when I get as old as you, Joe, I'm going to look like shit anyway, so I might as well just stop. <laughs> Arnold's like, oh, very funny, very funny. <laughs> what, John, what's the story involving me? Oh, okay, you, you and I go to the, an after party oh, yeah, with right. Tony Freeman and but where the where the where the el, the dwarfs were wrestling with the yeah, I, that's that's gonna be my favorite story. I'm gonna tell the dwarf story in a minute. 
Okay. So you want, we're there like the whole freaking night, and it's like 3 o'clock in the morning, and we're ready to leave. The club is closing down. You and I are in shirts. That's it. Long sleeve, you know, dress shirts, which are now sweat-soaked. And we open the door. It's 170 below zero, and the streets are deserted. There's no cabs in sight. We, you and I just look at each other like we're going to die. Yeah. And, and we start walking like we're going to actually walk to the hotel. And it was like five, six blocks. It was brutal, brutal, yeah. windy, cold. Then around the corner in a minivan comes Jay Nanian. <laughs> And saves our lives. Here I come to save the day. Mighty Mouse is bum bum bum. Yeah, JM did save us that night. JM really. saved our lives. If we probably, John, it, it was like it wasn't five or six blocks. It was like twenty blocks, probably. <laughs> it was far. I just remember looking down that street, and it was deserted. And you can see the stoplight, like fifty blocks up. You know, yeah. it, was it was like was we like, were in the Wild West someplace, all by ourselves. <laughs> I think that's how they would have done it. I left, the, I left the hotel late at night, and um, I was going somewhere, and there was one person on the street, same sort of thing, snowing, not one person on the street, and all of a sudden, as I'm crossing the street, Woo! I'm like, what the fuck? A fucking cop pulls me over, excuse me, sir, do you know you crossed when it said, do not walk? And I look around, and I'm like, but there's no one around. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, it doesn't matter, that's the rules. I said, yeah, but uh, anyway. I'm standing in the middle of the road. Is it one car coming? We're still talking in the middle of the street. It's about 2 a.m. in the morning, so you know there's no one around. Right. He's like, so where are you from? I said, Australia. He goes, oh, isn't that where Arnold's from? I'm like, no, that's Austria. I'm from Australia. You know where I got the kangaroos? He's like, well, do you have, do you have any ID? I said, no, my passport's back at the hotel. He's like, mm, okay, well, I'll let you go this time, but just be careful next time. <laughs> Like, you know what it's like, 2 a.m. at Columbus, Ohio, I was just snowing, I was the only person out on the street, <laughs> but he had to stop me because I was crossing when I said, don't walk. <laughs> you you must have that face, Lee, that people just want to, like, bust your balls or something like that. I don't know what it I think, is. I think, they just, I think they just like to talk to me. Maybe, maybe. Did you have a tattoo on your face back then? No, no. no. So I was actually, so. you know, normal looking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that's a very odd word to use. You've ever looked. Yeah. Yeah, my, you know. my Arnold story is um, the uh, year we, we held. How you going, John? How you going, John? We're going to give it a Dave story. <laughs> Boring. <laughs> my, my story is good. Arnold, I don't think okay. I can top the Arnold story, but, but we uh, had a booth. Uh, for two years, we had this crazy booth at the, at the Olympia when we worked for Muscle Development. We right. talked Steve into getting this huge stage, and we would run a stage show. And uh, I brought from Long Island with me the uh, Smalley brothers. Uh, I don't know, a lot of people out there probably don't know who they are. I have to find the clip because I have the video of it somewhere. And the Smalley brothers, when they got them together, they were like this uh, force of nature that was just, they loved to perform and, and have do hold contests and, and do all kinds of kooky, like circus-like stage acts on this thing. And... Um, there was an after party every year that Jason Deheer used to hold at the, I forget right. the name of the, the, the club they used to hold it at. And it was, it was like an old church. What was it called? It was like an old church or right, something. Right, 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 right. I can't remember the name of it, but. Um, no, no, it was like the building was an old church. No, I know. I can't remember the name of, the, uh, of, of what it was called, but um, Jason would uh, bring in weird acts. I think. And they I decided. Think, I, think, I, think the building, I think the building was called No One Cares. Carry on. <laughs> This particular year, this particular year, they decided that they were going to have um, a circus tent set up there with, with midget wrestling. And Mr. G had this obsession with midgets. So I thought it would be a great idea, publicity-wise, and we actually got a sponsor to cover this, this, this after-party entertainment, if we could get Mr. G to, to, to wrestle one of the midgets. Uh, and, you know, the midgets do this wrestling act, but, you know, Mr. G thought it was like WWE, like it was like, a, like it was performance, like they were like making up like a, like a skit almost. So he agreed. I got the midget people to, to agree via Jason to hear. But it was very stressful to me because I needed to videotape this thing, and they, and they did the midget wrestling late at night, like 12 midnight. So we get to the party, we get in there, 
and we get to the ring. We're a little late because Mr. G takes 10 years to do everything he's got to do. And they're like, oh, we're, do we're, we're done. This is the last match. I'm like, no, 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 no. You can't finish. We schedule this. We have to have Mr. G wrestle one of your midgets. They're like, nope, we're going home. I I and at this point, I'm like in a, in, a, in a panic because I have a sponsor. I'm like, we got to do this thing. I'm like, sorry, we're late. I begged them. I connived them. I used every manipulative trick I, I could get. I finally convinced the guy to do it. All right, you got 10 minutes. So now I got to find Mr. G, who's wandering through the club with his brother, warming up someplace. And um, once again, it was taking him forever to walk out. And they were going to cancel. They were leaving. So they got this one midget, who didn't really look so much like a midget, if you remember, John. He was, he was, he was like about maybe 4'11". He wasn't that short. And He's like short raised height. Mr. G was punching holes in the wall of the bathroom to psych himself up. And him and Mr. and his brother Robbie Smalls walks out to this like, they had their own boom box. Remember they had their own music intro. And they walk out like they're like, come, like it's Mike Tyson walking out for a prize fight into this yeah. ring. Now you gotta remember, we're inside a circus tent. It wasn't a real building and it was wait, cold. Wait, wait, you gotta remember, he had a feather bow on and sunglasses yeah. and a wig. Yeah, he looked gotta... like Mr. He looked like Hulk Hogan, basically. Yes. He was dressed as, except he was Mr. G Hogan. And right. he came out to the ring and I, and I got him in the corner and the midget was in the other corner and we had the camera set up and I was like, listen, he's like, I'm gonna talk to this guy because I, I gotta go over my act. I said, no, George, I said, this is not an act. These guys really wrestle. He goes, no, no, no. He goes, this is an act. It's made up. I said, I'm telling you. So he went up to the, he's like, I'll, I'll just improvise with the guy in the ring. So they ring the bell and all of a sudden they start circling the ring and I see Mr. G trying to talk to this guy, like whisper in his ear and like lock up with him, like wrestling. And next thing I know, this guy picks Mr. G up and Mr. G is six feet and lifts him over his head and body slams him into the mat. Like, like, like almost knocking the wind out of him. And Mr. G didn't expect it because he thought they were, they were fooling around. And then, he real, then Mr. G realized, this is for real. This guy is trying to win. And I believe, did they have a, a bell? Did they, did they ring the bell or something like that? And we had him in the corner. Yes. And I'm like, he's like, this guy's wrestling for real. I said, I told you they were wrestling for real. These guys want to kill you. They don't like tall people. And so Mr. G, when the bell rang and he went back out there, he went berserk, if you remember, John. He was yes. doing he was doing like Hulk Hogan like you know elbow drops on the guy and the guy was like trying to kill him and I guess Mr G got must have got hurt at some point you know when you get hurt you start going into that mode of, of I'm an, I I got to get out of this situation and Mr G dropped his elbow on this guy's head so many times I thought he killed the guy remember <laughs> and all the midgets ran into the ring and then we ran into the ring to try to break it up and. Uh, I guess Mr. I get I guess Mr. G won, right? No, he threw one of them. Yeah, yeah, but I'm saying I think in the end I think Mr. G was declared the winner, wasn't he? Yeah, but he threw a midget. He tossed them. <laughs> <laughs> All I know is that we almost we almost had a brawl with about 15 midgets. We don't we don't we don't, no, we don't like to be called midgets, you know. It's very not PC. Dwarfs. Dwarfs. I don't know what you call it. It was, it was that, called that was midget whole, wrestling. Uh, midget tossing. That he wanted to they see how far he could throw a midget. <laughs> oh, here we go. We're going to go talk about Steve and how tossing off midgets. All I know is that JM, once again, JM, JM Manny came up to me after that. He's like, that might have been the funniest thing I've ever seen in my life. He goes, did you plan that? I said, plan it. I, I'm having 14 nervous breakdowns because it almost didn't happen. They wanted to leave. And then, and then he, Mr. G thought it was, it was fake. And then when he didn't think it was fake, he almost killed the midget. You know, so... <laughs> <laughs> it was it was a very fun night, and I, and I remember that that whole weekend was 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 a classic weekend. I I never laughed so much my entire life. My I, my chest was hurting me. I was laughing so much. That that, that was a, a memorable memorable weekend. <laughs> they don't have parties like Where, that anymore. No. no where's remember. the video? Where's the video of it? I'll find the video on my computer. I'll put it up on the Arx Muscle site. Remember, because, remember when they used to have those big after parties after the Arnold and the Olympia and all the healthy people. Who was it one time? The guy that used to run EAS was on the dance floor pissing himself because he had so much GHB in the system they had to carry him out. Was that Bill <laughs> Phillips? For the sport. Yeah. yeah. Bill <laughs> Phillips? Was, really? Yeah. Yeah, they'd carry him out. He was, that, he was that fucked up on GHB. He's pissing himself and on the dance floor and crap. And, uh, <laughs> nothing but, yeah, you know, nothing like a pit, picture of health. <laughs> no, nothing like, you know what? I got to remember. You know, one year they had... Um, 
a friend of mine brought a bottle of GHB. But you know how, John, it used to, this is when it was legal. You remember it used to come concentrated and you had to, you had to, you had to water it down? Yeah, or it came in crystals too, remember? Well, this is when it came super concentrated. You'd have to, you had to right. dilute it. So we were <clears> diluting it for, so everyone could have their own little container of it. And once again, this was 100% legal at the time. And I didn't realize that it was absorbable. You know, we, we were like licking our fingers, you know, to, because it was getting, it, it's slimy. And Stick. I felt fine. And we got to the club, everyone had their little bottle. And then you know, I made the, the, the number one mistake in GHB usage, never drink alcohol with it. I had one shot of Grand Marnier and I, and I, and I basically passed out for the, for the whole party. Missed the whole thing. Two hours I was asleep, sitting on the side. Remember, I used to sell that in Max Muscle, and I was visiting my friend in Max Muscle one day, and um, I think, I forget what it was called, it was called something else, but it was blue, same as GHB, but it came in all different colors and right. shit. And this yeah. girl come in, this girl used to hang out in the store, come in once, and I was talking about it, she goes, oh, what's that stuff? And so she sat in the chair beside me, I said, oh, I heard it taste bad. She goes, let me try it. So she had a big cap full of it while she's sitting there. She goes, oh, it tastes bad, and my friend in the shop goes, oh, the more you drink it, it doesn't taste as bad. So she had a couple more capfuls. Could have been... 10, 15 minutes, I'm sitting there talking to my friend, and all of a sudden I hear this bird noise, it's like, tweet, 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 tweet. The girl's sitting in the chair thinking she's a fucking bird. Starts to, starts to, she's, she's rocking back and forth, tweeting like this, and at this time, while she's tweeting and rocking back and forth, some people come in and go, my God, are you Lee Priest? At the same time they say that, she slumps forward, so i got to grab her, pull her back in the chair and hold her up like Weekend of Bernie's now because I think she's passed out. <laughs> <laughs> so as I'm talking to these fans and I say, can we get a picture? I hear this noise and I look down under the chair. Now she's sitting in the chair, pissing herself through the plastic chair on the floor of Max Muscle. <laughs> I'm thinking, this girl's going to fucking die. So I have to drag her up. I take her into the bathroom at Max Muscle there. I close the door. I take the photos. When they leave, I open up the door and here she's laying on the floor in piss, vomited all over the fucking <laughs> toilet in the max muscle. So the, my friend and I had to close up the store and take her home. <laughs> <laughs> if she's dead, we're in trouble the next day. But that, oh, that was a funny time. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> when I would go to the firehouse back in the 90s, John, you would see people with their head on the table all the time there because everyone was G'd out of their mind there. Remember that? Yep. yep. And a, a friend of mine who was a chemist made tried to uh, uh, eliminate that factor and created what he called G+. Plus. <laughs> which was which was GHB with niacin and and yohimbi in it. Oh my and, god! Uh, and oh well, man, that that you could take out a whole room with that shit. <laughs> <laughs> the first, first night we were at a strip club, and he and he, he hands me this little bottle with these crystals in it, and he says, "Here, just take that. Pour some water in and take that." I go, "That looks like an awful lot." He goes, "No, no, no. no trust me." I go, "I don't fucking trust you." And I took about half of it out. And 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 did it and did half. And another friend of mine came. I gave him the other half. He did the other half. And we're sitting there. And about half an hour later, you know the, that niacin feeling, yeah. you know, starts creeping up. That tingling, you know. And then uh, the, G, the the G starts hitting. The Yohimbi were like up and down like a speedball, and <laughs> barely able to control ourselves. And I'm looking at my buddy who did the whole thing. And he's like gacked in the corner, <laughs> 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 And these two strippers are looking at me. They're like, what is gone? <laughs> the good old days, guys. Yeah, Lee, the good old days. Lee Priest, have a safe flight to the, uh, to the uh, Arnold Classic. And, uh, Thank you. Thank you. You'll, uh, I'm, at one of my, I'm at one of my favorite places now. Look. McDonald's. Ah, my favorite place, too. Yep. What's your favorite sandwich there, Lee? I just like the little junior burgers, really, or the fillet of fish. It's the only time I eat fish is when I have a McDonald's fillet of fish. Really? Remember, fillet remember, of fish? Remember, I, I, yeah, they say it's fish, but it could be dog. <laughs> I, remember, I remember you saying that the hormones in the burgers here are good, so I'm starting to eat McDonald's again because you said that's how you get big. Yes, yeah, so you Rack might... Acid. Lee claims yeah. he's natural, but he's really not because he's on McDonald's. Right. Oh, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't listen to Dave anyway. It's not like he ever got his pro card. So. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> well, Lee next Priest time, will next, be... Hey, hey, John, next time Dave's telling this story, stop looking at your phone and your computer. Look, try to look interested, please, like I was. <laughs> I figure I'm not on the screen at that moment. That's right. <laughs> I can see you. I can see you. <laughs> <laughs> 
You want to see Lee Priest this weekend? He'll be at the Black Skull <laughs> Nutrition booth, and uh, hopefully they'll let you into their arena so you can do a wrap up exactly. with Chris Acido. Exactly. If, cool. I'm not, if I'm not at the Black Skull booth, I'll be out in the foyer trying to get in. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. He might be crossing the street and get arrested because uh, he doesn't wait for the light to change. Yeah, walking. There you go. John Romano and I will not be at the Arnold today, this year. That might be a first that both you and I wow. miss the Arnold. You're not going to be there? No, no. I have babies. You're scared. Right. You're scared because I'm going. Yeah, I don't ah. want to. I, I, I think they made a rule that Lee Priest and Dave Palumbo and John Romano are not allowed at the Arnold at the same time. So it's Lee's. Not, this is Lee's yeah. year. This we is had, Lee's year. <laughs> yeah, we had to take off to the interview. year because Lee's going to be there. Yeah. You want me to interview Sean while I'm there? <laughs> All right, well, Lee, have a great flight, John. Great talking to you uh, for Dave Palumbo, John Romano, and Lee Priest. This is another episode of Iron Rage. We'll see you next week. Lee, what kind of watch is that? That's one of those Swall watches. What is it? Swall. Swall the clock. Swall?